guys, so today I'm going to be going over the Golden State Killer, which has been in the news recently, and I thought I'd go over the case and everything that went down, because it's... it's a lot. So, normally I start out with the backstory of the killer, but this time around I'm just going to start with the crimes and eventually leading to the killer, as the killer wasn't known until 40 years after these crimes took place. DNA evidence links the Golden State Killer to eight murders in Goleta, Ventura, Dana Point, and Irvine. Two other murders in Goleta are linked by modus operandi since there was not enough DNA. Investigators suspect the same killer was involved in three other murders, two in Rancho Cordova and one in Visalia. He also committed more than 50 known rapes in the California counties of Sacramento, Contra Costa, San Islas, San Joaquin, Alameda, Santa Clara, and Yolo. In addition to hundreds of incidents of burglaries, thefts, vandalism, peeping, stalking, and prowling. Very good guy. The Golden State Killer was originally known as the Vasilia Ransacker from April 1974 to December 1975. Over a 20-month period, the Ransacker was believed to be responsible for one murder and 120 burglaries. He broke into homes, scattered females' underwear, stole coins and low-value or personal items while ignoring banknotes and other valuable items in plain sight. So he wasn't doing it really for money. He was just a creepy man. After that, he uh, stepped up his game, and instead of just ransacking, he turned to raping women. He became the East Area Rapist from June 1976 to July of 1979. The killer was believed to have moved to the Sacramento area, progressing from burglary to rape in mid-1976. His initial modus operandi was to stalk middle-class neighborhoods at night in search of women who were alone in one-story homes, and usually near a school, creek, trail or other open space to provide a quick escape. Police believed that the rapist did extensive reconnaissance of the targeted neighborhood looking in windows and prowling in yards before selecting a home to attack. It is believed he sometimes even entered the home of future victims to unlock windows, unload guns, and plant ligatures for later use. He originally targeted women alone in their homes or with children. Uh, but eventually the offender decided to go after couples. His M.O. was to break in through a window or sliding glass door and awaken the sleeping occupants with a flashlight. Then he threatened them with a handgun and the victims were bound with ligatures he brought with him and gagged with towels that he ripped up into pieces. The female was usually made to tie up her male companion before being bound. He separated the couple, often stacking plates on top of the male, saying that if he heard them move, clatter, make any kind of noise, he would kill both of them. He moved the woman to the living room and often raped her repeatedly, sometimes for several hours, with at least 50 confirmed attacks, if not more. He continued with raping women for quite a long time until his first murder on February 2nd, 1978. Brian, a military policeman at Mather Air Force Base, and his wife, Katie Magor, were walking their dog in the Rancho Cordova area near where five East Area rapist attacks had occurred. They had fled after a confrontation in the street, but were chased down and shot dead. The many suspected the rapist as the killer since it was so close to his other attacks, and a shoelace was found near them. It was announced June 15th, 2016, that it was indeed the East Area Rapist that had killed them. From October 1979 to May of 1986, he was then known as the original Night Stalker, or Night Stalker at the time. The killer moved to Southern California and began killing his victims, first striking in Santa Barbara County in October of 1979. 
The attacks lasted until 81, with a lone attack in 1986. Only the couple in the first attack survived, alerting neighbors and forcing the intruder to flee. Other victims were murdered by gunshot or bludgeoning. He was known as the Night Stalker in the area before being renamed the original Night Stalker after serial killer Richard Ramirez received the former nickname. In 1979, on October 1st, an intruder broke in and tied up a Goleta couple. Uh, alarmed by hearing him say, I'll kill him to himself, the man and woman tried to escape when he left the room and the woman screamed. Realizing the alarm had been raised, the intruder fled on a bicycle. A neighbor, an FBI agent, responded to the noise and pursued the perpetrator, who abandoned the bicycle and a knife and fled on foot through local backyards, eventually escaping. On December 30th, 44-year-old Robert Offerman and 35-year-old Deborah Alexandra Manning were found shot dead at Offerman's condo on Avdina... Pequena in Goleta. Offerman's bindings were untied, indicating that he had lunged at the attacker. Neighbors had heard the gunshots. Uh, paw prints of a large dog were found at the scene, leading to speculation that the killer had brought a dog with him. The killer also broke into a vacant adjoining residence and stole a bike, later found abandoned on a street north of the scene. In 1980, on March 13th, 33-year-old Charlene Smith and 43-year-old Lyman Smith were found murdered in their Ventura home. Charlene Smith had been raped. A log from a wood pile on the side of the house was used to bludgeon the victims to death. Their wrists and ankles had been bound with drapery cord. An unusual Chinese knot, the diamond knot, was used on Charlene's wrists. The same knot was noted in the Sacramento East Area Rapist Attacks, at least one confirmed case of which was publicly known. The murderer was therefore briefly given the nickname Diamond Knot Killer. On August 19th, 24-year-old Keith Eli Harrington and 27-year-old Patrice Briscoe Harrington were found bludgeoned to death in their home on Cockshell Drive in Dana Point's Gail Shore's gated community. Patrice also had been raped. Although there was evidence that the Harrington's wrists and ankles were bound, no ligatures or murder weapon were found at the scene. Uh, the Harrington's had been married for three months at the time of their deaths. Patrice was a nurse in Irvine and Keith was a medical student at UC Irvine. Keith's brother Bruce later spent nearly two million dollars supporting California Proposition 69 authorizing DNA collection from all California felons and certain other criminals so that things like this wouldn't happen again so crimes don't go unsolved for so long which is really thoughtful of him. 1981 on February 6th 28 year old Manula Witun was raped and murdered in her Irvine home. Although her body had signs of being tied before she was bludgeoned, no ligatures or murder weapon were found at the scene. The victim was married, her husband was away hospitalized, and she was alone at the time of the attack. Her television was found in the backyard, possibly the killer's attempt to make it look like a botched robbery. On July 27th, 1981, 35-year-old Sherry Domingo and 27-year-old Gregory Sanchez both were attacked in Domingo's residence on Toltec Way in Goleta. She was living there temporarily. It was owned by her deceased relative and it was up for sale. Gregory had not been tied and was shot and wounded in the cheek before he was bludgeoned to death with a garden tool. Some believe that Gregory may have realized he was dealing with the man responsible for the Offerman Manning murders and tried to tackle the killer rather than be tied up. Again, no neighbors responded to the gunshot, because they're neat. I mean, I'd be terrified too, but also part of me would be like, oh my god, what's going on? I might send someone else to go do it, like I wouldn't go myself. <laughs> but I'd send someone else to go see what was going on, like, someone could be hurt. Like, if you got there in time, you might save them. You're saying. Sherry was raped and bludgeoned, bruises on her wrists and ankles indicate that she had been tied, although the restraints were missing. A piece of shipping twine was found near the bed and fibers from an unknown source were scattered over her body. Authorities believe that the attacker 
may have worked as a painter or in a similar job at the Kale Real shopping center as there were miniature paint chips found at the scene. Then there was silence for almost five years until 1986. On May 4th, 18-year-old Janelle Lisa Cruz was found after she was raped and bludgeoned to death in her Irvine home. Her family was on vacation in Mexico at the time of the attack. A pipe wrench reported missing by Cruz's father was thought to be the murder weapon. The Southern California murders were not initially thought to be connected by investigators in their respective jurisdictions. A Sacramento detective strongly believed that the East Area Rapist was responsible for the Goleta attacks, but the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Department attributed them to a local career criminal who was later murdered. Investigating the crimes not committed in Goleta caused local police to follow false leads related to men who were close to the female victims. One person later cleared was charged with two murders. Uh, the cases were linked almost entirely by DNA testing many years later. So at the time, they didn't really know how to connect them, but they found a way through DNA. Now, the suspect profile. The physical description of the man was that he was white, about 5 foot 10, slender athletic build, about size 9's nine, 9.5 shoe, type A blood, non-secretor, which means his sperm does not contain blood group antigens, and he's physically agile as he continued to escape every time people had seen him. Then there was his psychological profile, which is quite a lot longer. This is what they believed that the killer was like in his average day life psychologically. He engaged in paraphilic behavior and brutal sex in his personal life, engaged in sex with prostitutes, had some knowledge of police investigative methods, evidence gathering techniques, um, he was sexually functional, because, you know, you be raping people, um, and it worked. <laughs> uh, he dressed well and wouldn't stand out in, like, high-end neighborhoods, uh, lived or worked near Ventura, California in 1980, uh, had good physical condition, uh, skilled cat burglar as he got into people's houses quite easily, um, and liked to steal things. <laughs> Had a criminal record as a teen, which was expunged. Um, had some means of income, but didn't work in the early morning hours. He usually killed people during that time. <laughs> um, hated women for actual or perceived wrongs. Uh, intelligent and articulate. Uh, neat and well-organized. With a well-maintained car. Which I don't know how you would know if he had a well-maintained car, but... Mm, yeah, he had a well-maintained car. Uh, prepped in the pep peeped in the windows of many people who were not attacked and was self-assured and confident so he had everything he needed while this was all going on there were a few writings and phone calls taking place I'll start with the writings first in December of 1977 someone claiming to be the East Area Rapist sent a poem called Excitement's Crave to the Sacramento Bee the Sacramento's mayor's office, and television station KVIE. On December 11th, a masked man eluded pursuit by law enforcement personnel after alerting authorities by telephone that he would strike on Watt Avenue that night. Here is Excitement's Crave. All those morals surviving birth upon facing maturity take inventory of their worth to prevailing society. Choosing values becomes a task. Oneself must seek satisfaction. The selected route will unmask character when plans take action. Accepting some work to perform at fixed pay but promise for more is a recognized social norm, as in decorum seeking lore. Achieving while others lifting should be cause for deserving fame. Leisure tempts exciting seeking what's right and expected seems tame. Jesse James had been seen by all, and Son of Sam has an author. Others now feel temptation's call. Sacramento should make an offer. To make a movie of my life that will pay for my planned exile. Just now, I'd like to add the wife of a mafia lord to my file. Your East Area Rapist and Deserving Pest. See you in the press or on TV. During the investigation of the 42nd attack of rape in Danville, investigators discovered three sheets of notebook paper near where a suspicious vehicle had been reportedly been parked. The first sheet contained what appears to be an essay on General George Armstrong Custer. 
The second sheet contains a journal style entry describing a teacher who made students write lines, which the author found humiliating. And this is what it read. Mad is the word. The word that reminds me of sixth grade. I hated that year. I wish I had known what was going to be going on during my sixth grade year, the last and worst year of elementary school. Mad is the word that remains in my head about my dreadful year as a sixth grader. My madness was one that was caused by disappointments that hurt me very much. Disappointments from my teachers, such as field trips that were planned that got canceled. My sixth grade teacher gave me a lot of disappointments, which made me very mad and made me build a state of hatred in my heart. No one ever let me down that hard before, and I never hated anyone as much as I did him. Disappointment wasn't the only reason that made me mad in my sixth grade class. Another was getting in trouble at school, especially talking. That's what really bugged me with writing sentences. Those awful sentences that my teacher made me write. Hours and hours I'd sit and write 50, 100, 150 sentences a day and night. I'd write those dreadful paragraphs which embarrassed me and, more important, made me ashamed of myself, which in turn, deep down inside, made me realize that writing sentences wasn't fair. It wasn't fair to make me suffer like that. It just wasn't fair to make me sit and write until my bones ached, till my hand felt very horrid, every horrid pain it ever had, and as I wrote, I got madder and madder until I cried. I cried because I was ashamed, and I cried because I was disgusted. I cried because I was mad, and I cried for myself, kid who kept on having to write those damn sentences. My angriness from sixth grade will scar my memory for life, and I will be ashamed for my sixth grade year forever. On the last piece of paper was a hand-drawn map of what appeared to be a suburban neighborhood with the word punishment scrawled across the reverse side. Investigators were unable to identify the area depicted in the map, although the artist clearly had knowledge of architectural layout and landscape design. According to Detective Larry Poole, the map is a fantasy location representing the rapist's desired striking ground. Ain't that lovely? Because that's what I want to hear. Then there were the phone calls. The first call was on March 18th, 1977. The Sacramento County Sheriff's Office received three calls from a man claiming to be the East Area Rapist. None were recorded. Because why not? The first two calls received at 4.15 and 4.30 p.m. were identical and ended with the caller laughing and hanging up. The final call came in at 5 p.m. with the caller saying, I'm the East Side Rapist and I have my next victim already stalked and you guys can't catch me. The second call came in on December 2nd, 1977. A man claiming to be the rapist called the Sacramento police saying, you're never gonna catch me, East Area Rapist, you dumb fuckers. I'm gonna fuck again tonight. Careful. The call was recorded and later released. Similarly to the previous call, the next victim was attacked that same night. The next call was December 9th, 1977, and this was actually a call given to one of his victims. A previous victim received a phone call which she attributed to the attacker. The caller said, Merry Christmas, it's me again. The next day, on December 10th, 1977, shortly after 10 p.m., the Sacramento authorities received a phone call, two identical ones, saying, I'm going to hit tonight, Watt Avenue. Both were recorded, and the caller was identified as the same person who placed the December 2nd call. Law enforcement patrols were increased to that night, and at 2.30 a.m., a masked man eluded officers after being seen on a bicycle on Watt Avenue Bridge. When spotted again at 4.30 a.m., he discarded the bicycle and fled on foot. The bicycle had been stolen. On January 2nd, 1978, the first known rape victim received a wrong number call asking for Ray. The call was recorded, and police suspect that it may be the same caller who made a threatening call to her later that evening. That call was also recorded and identified by the victim as the voice of her assailant. The caller said, Gonna kill you. Gonna kill you. Gonna kill you. Bitch. 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 Fucking whore. Wow, you're such a good person. Man. Could be nice. January 6th, 1978, a man claiming to be the East Area Rapist called the Contact Counseling Service and said, I have a problem. I need help because I don't want to do this anymore. After a short conversation, the caller said, I believe you're tracing this call and hung up. So, I mean, 
I don't know if he was just taunting them by pretending he needed help, or if he actually meant what he said. I don't know. Honestly, I don't think anyone knows. In 1982, a previous victim received a call at her place of work during which the rapist threatened to rape her again. According to the Contra Costa County investigator Paul Holes, the rapist must have chanced to patronize the restaurant and recognized his victim there. In 1991, a previous victim received a phone call from the perpetrator and spoke with him for one minute. She could hear a woman and children in the background, leading to the speculation that he had a family. You know what is so screwed up about half these stories is that some of these killers have families, and it's like, how can you sit there and take care of your kids and come home to your wife and have a job, like a normal life and then go out at night and murder people. Like, I don't, I don't understand. The final call took place on April 6, 2001, one day after an article in the Sacramento Bee linked the original Night Stalker and the East Area Rapist as one person. A victim of the rapist received a call from him. He asked, remember when we played? Fuck. So let's get into the investigation and how he finally was caught. Before officially connecting the original Night Stalker to the East Area Rapist in 2001, some law enforcement officials sought to link the Goleta, Goleta cases as well. The links were primarily due to similarities in MO. One of the already linked original Night Stalker double murders occurred in Ventura, 40 miles southeast of Goleta, and the remaining murders were committed in Orange County, an additional 90 miles southeast. In 2001, several rapes in Contra Costa County, believed to have been committed by the East Area Rapists, were linked by DNA to the Smith, Harrington, Whithoon, and Cruz murders. A decade later, DNA evidence indicated that the Domingo Sanchez murders were committed by the Golden State Killer, so everything was coming together. During the investigation, several people were considered and later eliminated as suspects. The first was Brett Glasby from Goleta was considered a suspect by Santa Barbara County investigators. He was murdered in Mexico in 1982 before the murder of Janelle Cruz, which eliminated him as a suspect. The next was Paul Cornfield Schneider, a high-ranking member of the Aran Brotherhood living in Orange County when the Harringtons, Manula, Witten, and Janelle Cruz murders occurred. A DNA test cleared him in the 1990s. Lastly, there was Joe Elsip, a friend and business partner of the victim, Lyman Smith. Elsip's pastor said that Elsip had confessed to him during a family counseling session. Elsip was arraigned for the Smith murders in 1982, but the charges were later dropped, and his innocence was confirmed by DNA testing in 1997. On April 24, 2018, Sacramento County Sheriff's deputies arrested the killer, Joseph D'Angelo, as he was a 100% match to the DNA found. Now, let me give you a little backstory on Joseph. Joseph James D'Angelo was born in Bath, New York, and he spent part of his childhood in West Germany, where his father was stationed. While there, the 9 or 10 year old witnessed his 7 year old sister being raped by two soldiers. That's gonna fuck you up. That's gonna fuck you up big time. I mean, but if I saw my sister being raped, I don't think I would turn to raping other people, but that's just my opinion. The family put down roots in Rancho Cordova, a then unincorporated town in California. He joined the Navy after high school and served in the Vietnam War before returning to California to pursue an associate's degree at Sierra College. There he met fellow student Bonnie Colwell and the two became engaged. But Colwell grew alarmed by D'Angelo's behavior, which included hunting illegally and kicking a dog to death because it was chasing them during a motorcycle ride. The dog chased them while he was on a motorcycle and he kicked it to death. All right. <laughs> After he asked her to help him cheat on an exam for his abnormal psychology class, she dumped him. And I don't blame her. After the breakup, Joseph showed up outside the window of her house where she lived with her parents. He had a gun and ordered her to go to Reno and marry him. Not the way to do it, sir. Don't threaten her with a gun. That's going to make her less likely to want to come with you, but 
That's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Bonnie alerted her father, who instructed her to lock herself in the bathroom while he confronted Joseph. When he later told her to the coast was clear, he never explained what he did or said to make him leave. Later, victims of the Golden State Killer would describe him breaking into tears while attacking them, saying, I hate you, Bonnie. But Bonnie left you for good reasons, so she shouldn't, I hope she doesn't blame herself for anything because she should be happy she got out when she did. He completed his bachelor's degree at Cal State Sacramento, then enrolled in the police academy before landing his first police uh, job in Exeter, California. There, he married and eventually had three daughters before his wife left him in 1990. He was charged with eight counts of first-degree murder with special circumstances. On May 10th, the Santa Barbara County District Attorney's Office charged Joseph with four additional counts of first-degree murder. This all happened in 2018. Identification of Joseph had begun four months earlier when officials led by Detective Paul Holes and FBI lawyer Steve Kramer uploaded the killer's DNA profile from a Ventura County rape kit to the personal genomics website GED Match. The website identified 10 to 20 people who had the same great, great, great grandparents as the Golden State Killer, a team of five investigators working with genealogist Barbara Ray Venner used this list to construct a large family tree. From this tree, they established two suspects. One was ruled out by a relative's DNA test, leaving Joseph as the main suspect. On April 18th, a DNA sample was surreptitiously collected from the door handle of Joseph's car, and later another sample was collected from a tissue they pulled out of his garbage can. Both were matched to samples associated with the Golden State Killer crimes. Joseph offered up a confession of sorts after his arrest that cryptically referred to an inner personality named Jerry that apparently forced him to commit the wave of crimes that ended abruptly in 1986. According to the Sacramento County Prosecutor Thien Ho, Joseph said to himself while alone in the police in interrogation room after his arrest in April 2018 that I didn't have the strength to push him out. He made me. He went with me. It was like in my head. I mean, he's a part of me. I didn't want to do those things. I pushed Jerry out and had a happy life. I did all those things. I destroyed all their lives. So now I've got to pay the price. Joseph cannot be charged with rapes or burglaries as the statute of limitations had expired for those offenses, but he could be charged with 13 counts of murder and 13 counts of kidnapping. Uh, Joseph was arraigned in Sacramento on August 23rd, 2018. In November 2018, prosecutors from six involved counties correctly estimated, collectively estimated, that the case could cost taxpayers $20 million and last 10 years. At an April 10th, 2019 court proceeding, prosecutors announced that they would seek the death penalty. Which I'm not surprised. <laughs> Um, a little over a year later, on March 4th, 2020, Joseph offered to plead guilty if the death penalty was taken off the table, which at the time, it was not accepted. But, Joseph pled guilty to 26 charges, including 13 murder charges and 13 kidnapping charges on June 29th, 2020, in exchange for receiving a life sentence without the possibility of parole, rather than the death penalty. His official sentencing hearing will be in August. To conclude, I am so happy that they caught this man because, <laughs> dang, dude, just shit. It's it's a lot. Like they didn't catch him until 2018, and these his last crime happened in '86. Like, and of course it could have been Jerry, this man in his head that made him do it. I'm not gonna deny that he could be mentally damaged. Of course. He's got issues for doing everything he did, so it's not even a surprise. I'm very happy that he is being charged, at least with the murders and kidnapping. I wish that the rape uh, limitations on that were longer, because he raped 50-plus people, and he can't be charged with any of it because it happened so long ago. It's like, bro. But I believe, from what I read... At his court hearing in August, some of the rape victims who are still around are going to come to the hearing and actually talk. I don't think they'll be able to... They can't charge him with anything of those. 
but I believe they still get a chance to talk and share how awful of a human being this man is. I mean, he has kids. I wonder what his kids think. Like, oh my god, my dad's a serial killer. Like, I, w I wouldn't even know what to do if I found out my dad did that stuff. I don't know how, I, I don't know what I would do. I would be heartbroken. I'd be disgusted. I, it'd be a lot. It would just be too much, I think. He's in his 70s now, so if if he does get charged with a life sentence, it's not going to be that long. He might be dead within the next few years. I just hope that everything goes to plan and he gets charged and put in prison before he gets sick or before he dies or anything happens. Because if he dies before this hearing in August, I'm going to be fucking pissed off that they got so close and then just taken. I hope not. I hope he's healthy enough to go to jail. And then if he dies in prison, I don't give a shit. At least he's gone. I hope you guys enjoyed today's story as much as you can enjoy a story about serial killers. Most of the stories that I cover on this channel are unsolved mysteries, kidnappings, disappearances, murders that have never been solved. Today I decided to do one that has been solved because I think we deserve a little happiness for once in our lives. Of course, everything he did is horrible. He raped 50 plus people, he killed a ton of other people, and he's caused a lot of harm and damage to many. But I think at least we got a better outcome than some. Most crimes that happened that long ago do not get solved because the person maybe died or they don't have enough evidence to find the person. I'm just glad that they found him. All right, guys. I'll see you next Thursday with another True Crime Thursday and Monday with whatever I decide to post.